Folks, we are expecting just a couple more, but we're going to get started. What I'm going to do is the same as we always do. We're going to mute you during the talking portion, but we will definitely invite you to unmute at the end and you can um, put any questions you have during the talk into the chat box. Janine, I think most of you know uh, co-host Janine Wilson. Uh, Janine is going to be with us today to monitor the chat box, to let you back in. If your internet goes fluey and you get dumped off and you need to re-enter, she'll get you back into the talk. And absolutely. So uh, Janine is, is absolutely here to support you. And what we'll do is have a look at the slides, have a look at some of the handouts. I'm gonna try something new today. Um, I'm going to try to take you on a tour of the website, so hopefully that will work for everybody. And uh, while we're um, doing these things, what we're going to do is um, read the disclaimer. I know that many of you are familiar with the disclaimer, but it's uh, very important that we... Ah, my mobile Wi-Fi is being a little difficult with me right now. Um, it's not letting me onto the web page. Gotta love that. Let's try again. So what we're going to do is just get the disclaimer out of the way and then we will be good to go. Um, well, Janine, every time I try to go to my web page, the mobile Wi-Fi takes over. So this should be interesting, but let's give it a try. Screen share. Now, do you folks see living safely in the community, learning about wandering? Then here we go. This is the disclaimer. We are excited to be able to connect with our clients during these times of self-isolation and social distancing. We know that staying connected is so important. Please note that we are using Zoom and online technology that helps us connect with you securely. We believe that privacy measures put in place by Zoom will protect your privacy, but urge you to also take steps to protect your privacy, such as using secure Wi-Fi and being aware of your surroundings. Also, since we are working from home, please be assured we have taken every measure to ensure your privacy is respected from others who are social distancing with us. All right. I want to just give you a tiny bit of background on finding your way. So it was part of the Ontario's Action Plan for Seniors and an advisory committee came together and it included um, the Senior Secretariat, the Government of Ontario, the Alzheimer's Society and the OPP. So the police, um, the experts in dementia and the government worked hand in hand. The reason that the committee was formed and Finding Your Way was developed had to do with, unfortunately, the fact that there were um, several deaths that occurred as a result of missing incidents. That's when people uh, were confused and got lost. And so there's a need for both awareness and prevention. And that's what Finding Your Way is all about. Just, I, I recognize most of the names, but we always make sure that everybody's on the same page. So we're gonna look very quickly at what is dementia, and why that would influence why somebody might get lost. I think most of you are aware that dementia is not a normal part of aging. It is not something that's gonna to happen to everybody for sure. When you have dementia, it means that you have uh, something that is affecting your brain that can last anywhere from two to 20 years. There are a number of underlying reasons for dementia. There are many different types of dementia, but when we're talking about dementia, we are usually talking about something of slow progression. I'm sorry to say that we don't have a treatment or a cure for any of the irreversible dementias. Uh, we do know that lifestyle tends to be connected to a higher risk. So although we all want chocolate for Valentine's Day, at least I want chocolate for Valentine's Day, I got to encourage you to uh, live a healthy lifestyle. Just treat yourself once in a while to, to those things. Uh, exercise, cognitive challenge, and a good heart smart diet. That's what we really need to reduce the risk of developing a dementia. When we talk about dementia, it's 
not really a disease. It's a set of symptoms that comes with a disease. And there are a variety, and we'll look at a few of those. But when you have dementia, there are changes in memory, language, judgment, reasoning, your ability to perform daily tasks, and your ability to um, communicate personality and behavior can change over time. So these are some of the dementias that unfortunately are considered irreversible. Um, there is no cure. Uh, Alzheimer's is the most common type that there is, uh, tends to strike after age 65, um, tends to start with memory loss. But if you have memory loss alone, it, it's not Alzheimer's. You got a problem maybe, but dementia is much, much more and Alzheimer's disease is much more than memory loss alone. There's something called FTD or frontotemporal dementias. And those dementias tend to strike at a younger age. We think only seniors can get lost, not necessarily so. The FTDs usually don't start with memory loss, but they start with judgment and behavior and language loss. Uh, Lewy body dementia looks like a cross between Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and um, people really fluctuate in their cognition, and they often have vivid visual hallucinations. Um, more men than women are affected with Lewy body and more women than men are affected with Alzheimer's. Uh, vascular dementia, a very, very common type. They used to say it was the second most common type of dementia, uh, certainly uh, one that you will um, find is brought up in the literature when they talk about healthy lifestyle good way to reduce vascular dementia. And then I'm sorry to say that you can have more than one at a time. You can have Alzheimer's at the same time as vascular and young onset. Now, Janine, I may be wrong because I might not be seeing the same screen you are. Did you hit the record button? Great, okay, just needed to check. Um, don't worry, folks, uh, we are recording today, but you will not see that. Um, you will not be shown and you will not um, be in any way in the recording. We're just going to be showing the slides on the recording. So don't panic about that. So the importance of finding your way. Our numbers are huge. Just in Waterloo, Wellington, there are over 13,000 people. Uh, living with some form of dementia right now. Um, in Canada, there's a new case every four minutes. And I bring that up not to scare you, but because it means that uh, there's a high likelihood that everybody, whether they are a relative of somebody uh, living with dementia or a friend of somebody living with dementia, may still have an interaction with somebody. There are so many people in the community living with dementia. So the importance of finding your way. I've just given you a few of the stats. In fact, worldwide, every three seconds, somebody else develops some form of dementia. When you look at stats, they say that six out of 10 people will have what they call an incident where they go missing and often without warning. So whether you call it three out of five or six out of 10, those are high numbers. Those are high probability. Those are the cases we know of. Uh, there could likely be many more cases that are never even reported. Half of those not found within 24 hours, unfortunately, will be gravely injured or could succumb. They could die. And that's why finding your way is actually a really important piece of uh, dementia care. We want to make sure that the public knows what to do and that anybody who cares for somebody with dementia knows what to do. Nearly 75% of those who go missing are found within about three quarters, I mean, one quarter of a mile from their home. So they, they don't get all that far away sometimes. And that's a good thing. So Finding Your Way was developed. They want to raise public awareness and education to enhance, you know, the community's response to missing incidents. They want to... Um, increase resources to family caregivers to improve prevention and, and help them be more prepared. They want to build partnerships with um, ethno-cultural organizations to improve outreach to people and families 
um, often who, who might not uh, necessarily be connected as well as others in the community. And obviously police training to add modules about missing incidents to the current police curriculum. Um, we, we know that that's been done. So accessing finding your way materials, everything that we're gonna talk about today all the program tools, anything you want to print, anything you want to read about is available on the website. And I made sure that the links were live in the um, PDF that I sent you. So if you, you can type in finding your way Ontario.ca or you can just click the link in the slides that I sent you, it'll take you right to the website. And I am gonna try to get us to the website later. So the kind of things that you might look for, they will have um, uh, information about dementia, some suggestions and, and guidelines for you, an identification kit, and we're gonna look at that in some more detail, information on locating devices. Um, it says an instant response checklist. That's a very fancy way of saying, what do you do if someone goes missing? Uh, we talk in plain English, they talk in, in um, politically correct terminology, and a post-instant response checklist. That means what's the best way for reuniting after an incident? So I see at the bottom here, I've listed all the different languages that this is available in. This is not just um, a website that supplies English uh, information. There are uh, 13, 13 different languages that this material is translated into. So, um, I don't know why that slide's sitting there, but why a person might get lost. Um, I'm gonna take you through these in some detail because this is really important to think about because there are many reasons that somebody might have a missing incident. And just saying, oh, they have some form of dementia doesn't get specific enough to help us problem solve and, and help keep people safer. So here are just a few of the potential reasons. Loss of memory. Um, due to short-term memory loss, a person might set out to run an errand and then forget where they were going or why. Uh, they may go out looking for a family member because they forgot where their family member said they were going. I remember we had an, an incident with a family in, uh, in Cambridge and um, the, the husband had dementia and the wife was the caregiver. And the wife said to him, I'm going in the basement. I'm going to go toss some laundry and I'll be downstairs for a while doing laundry. So all she trotted down to the basement and he forgot pretty quickly what she had said and looked around didn't see her, didn't think to go to the basement, you know, just looked around on the first floor of the house and then left because he thought, oh, she must have gone out. I guess I'll go look. And out he went. And um, now they, that situation was happily resolved. That story has a happy ending, but it can happen in a moment and it can happen without any malicious intent. It's just that the person has forgotten what you told them. Another reason that somebody might go missing is the person may feel anxious or nervous in a new environment. They, they might be uh, visiting somewhere or they might be taken somewhere or they might have you know, memory impairment that even though they've been in this environment before or for a period of time, it doesn't look familiar to them. Often folks with bad memory impairment, they're, they're living now in, in the current year, but they only have access to old memories and old information. So they go looking for the familiar. They may be, this ties right in, searching for the past. Unfortunately, people may be looking for someone or something related to their past. It could be a house or a place they once lived, or it could be a person. It could even be that that person has passed away, but they don't forget that or they forget that, they, they don't remember that they're gone now. Um, excess energy. Uh, people with dementia may find it harder uh, to concentrate on tasks and they may walk away from an activity and just keep walking to have something to do. Um, so that's something that sometimes feeds into it. 
uh, people confusing night and day. People with dementia may, may have an impaired circadian rhythm. That's the part of our, our body that helps us remember sleep at night, stay awake during the day. Uh, they may have insomnia. They may wake up in the early hours. They may be disoriented. They may think it's daytime, even though it's dark outside. I'm awake. Okay, I better get up. I better go. Um, they may decide to go for a walk or they may think they need to get up and go to work or get up and go and do something. Um, there was a, a woman, again, this story is from Cambridge. There was a caregiver who shared with us the story of her mother. And um, her mother uh, had, had dementia and lived with this woman. But over one of the, uh, the holidays, one of, I think it was Thanksgiving, um, they took the mom to visit the other sister. And the other sister lived in Toronto. And mom was going to stay there for the long weekend. And um, they were having a lovely time together. And everybody went to bed that night. And mom woke up in the middle of the night and nobody heard her and she got up and went out. And so now she is in Toronto, not Cambridge. She's out in the early, early morning hours. Nobody knows that she's missing because everybody else is still asleep in bed. This woman safely actually made her way down to Sick Kids Hospital because she used to work at Sick Kids. And when she got to Sick Kids, um, the security guard that, that met her at Sick Kids realized that something was wrong and, uh, and, and phoned the, the police. There was a happy reunion. Um, I'm happy to say that ne never, never happened again, but it can happen when it's unexpected. People, and, and I wanted to lead this into the next point, which is the job to for, perform. She, she got up and she thought, I better go to work. So people living with dementia, they may believe that they have a task to do, whether it's go to work or take care of the children or go to school, even if that hasn't been their role for decades, for years and years and years, they often still believe that that's what they're supposed to be doing. And off they go to try to do that. I remember um, we had a, uh, an incident in uh, and I was talking to the police about it. And there was a gentleman who was uh, very confused and left his safe environment. And there was quite, quite a search for this man, an extended search. And they eventually figured out what he used to do was work on the railway. No, he didn't hop a train, thank goodness. But what they did is they started walking all the rail tracks in the area and they did find him along the side of the rail tracks because that made sense to him. That's my job, that's where I work. I know the rail tracks. So there he was uh, on, on the rail tracks. Another reason that people might get up and move around and then keep moving actually has to do with discomfort or pain. Um, often you've probably heard the term, walk it off. Just walk it off, you know, get up, walk it off. Um, sometimes walking can ease physical discomfort. Um, you know, if people are feeling stiff or if their back is sore or um, unless there's excruciating stabbing pain every time they take a step, sometimes they try to walk to, to relieve discomfort. So, you know, making sure that people are not in pain is important. Regular medical checkups are important. And the other thing that happens is that folks, unfortunately, if they're living with a dementia, sometimes have an inability to differentiate dreams from reality. And it might cause the person to go into action based on the dream and they think the dream is real. And so they go to deal with whatever they had been dreaming about. So those are some of the reasons that somebody might leave what we think is a comfortable, safe environment. It makes perfect sense in the mind of the person, it just doesn't always make sense to us. So there's a little booklet called Finding Your Way, and uh, it has quite a bit of information in it. This is on the website. It includes um, basic information, physical description, identifying features, recent photo, medical info, potential places to look, um, 
car and license plate information, emergency contact information in, uh, in an ID form. The booklet is uh, fairly small. It's uh, five by seven. So it's half the size of a standard sheet of paper. And although the ID form is, is excellent in that booklet, it might be a bit small for you. So they have a large version as well on the website and you can print the larger version and it can be filled in with the personal information and passed on to searchers in case there's an emergency, it can save time. So this is sort of what it looks like. Um, the ID form is there. So if you would like a larger version, again, that's available on the website. If for any reason you need any of the materials that I'm talking about and you don't have access to print them yourselves, please phone the office. Contact the Alzheimer's Society. Just phone in. Say that you don't have a printer, you don't have access to the web, and that you need the finding your way information. And they can send that out to you. They can make sure that you get it. I want to talk a tiny bit about locating devices because sometimes they're helpful. Sometimes they're useful to locate a person who's lost and they can provide um, an increased sense of independence to a person who wishes to go out alone, but may become lost. Um, before I worked for the Alzheimer's Society, I was a volunteer and in, they used to have something called the Volunteer Companion Program. And I was a volunteer uh, because a family called in and the wife who had dementia loved to go out walking loved to go out walking and they had a family dog and they figured as long as she was out with the family dog, everything would be cool. The dog would always know its way home. Well, uh, not true. The dog did not know its way home on a regular basis and couldn't just lead her home when she got confused. So I went walking with her whenever I went out, that was my thing to do with her. And we would, we would go for, for walks together. Um, but if, and this is a long time ago, if they had had better technology in those days, she could have perhaps used a locating device and been comfortable and continued her walks. Um, now, there's a sentence at the bottom, and just because it's at the bottom of the page doesn't mean it's not important. I want to really emphasize that using any locating device does not decrease the need to check in often with the person. You know, it, we, we can't cease being vigilant. So a word about locating devices. There's GPS, you've probably heard of GPS. It stands for Global Positioning Systems and there are a variety of models available. Um, there are things that are run by radio frequency. Uh, Project Lifesaver is an example and I'll speak to that in a minute. Um, it's uh, often found in a wristband that somebody would wear. Not quite as small as my watch, uh, bigger than my watch, but, um, and then the newer technologies in smartphones, cell phones, tablets, that sort of thing. There is a web page, uh, the Finding Your Way Ontario Locating Technology web page. It is under reconstruction right now. When I checked it two days ago, it still had its sign up saying, hey, we're fixing. So um, if you go on the website today and you go to this page and it's not there, we know it's not there. Uh, it's being worked on, don't panic. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, uh, this was a handout that I included for you and I'm gonna speak to it in, in some detail. There are really in our area, in the Waterloo Wellington area, there are several different ways that we can help support keeping people safe. It's not that one way is better than another, it's that all of these together can work to keep somebody safe. So you wouldn't probably just say, oh, I'll put my relative on the vulnerable persons registry or, oh, I'll check out the Finding Your Way website you probably want to uh, basically cross-pollinate. You wanna do several, several things. So I'm going to take you through these in, in some detail. I actually have a handout for you and we'll talk about them. Um, I wanna just mention some other helpful devices. Uh, the Medic Alert Safely Home we're going to, to look at um, I'm sure you're familiar with Medic Alert. Many people wear it as a wristband. 
Um, you can get it to wear around your neck or on your ankle as well. And the Medic Alert Safely Home uh, lets people immediately know that somebody has some uh, cognitive impairment, that they have memory loss. It's got blue ink on it as opposed to red. Uh, normally they come with red ink. The Medic Alert Safely Home comes with blue ink. Um, there are various, we're not promoting any one company over another, but uh, I tried to use names that might be familiar to you. For example, Lifeline with Auto Alert. There are many different companies that put out that kind of a uh, safety system. Uh, motion detectors, so that if somebody um, can trigger a light or can trigger an alarm, uh, if they are leaving a particular area. Um, with the new technology, there are all sorts of Bluetooth locating devices. Uh, Posters or banners, I've seen people try things like a stop sign on the inside of the door, stop, turn around, or they put a little um, cloth barrier across a doorway. So there's ventilation and there's vision, but it's just a reminder maybe to somebody to not go, not go through that doorway. Uh, Project Lifesaver is available in Guelph and Wellington County. It has not come to Waterloo yet, but we'll talk about that. Uh, there are a lot of door alarms and you can get them at your local hardware store. They don't have to be sophisticated alarm systems. Uh, you know, you can spend 20 bucks and, and get an alarm system at, at uh, the hardware store. Or you'll find them in um, maybe a child safety section as well. Uh, GPS locators, uh, mats with built-in monitoring so that if somebody gets up out of their chair or gets up out of bed, as soon as they step on the mat, it emits a sound and you know that they're up or it startles them into sitting back down again. Um, and then of course we have lots of educational materials that you can get on, uh, on what to do. And that's why we're gonna have today's session and that's why we're gonna take you through the website. So the most important strategies for keeping people with dementia safe in the community are to know the risks, make a safety plan, and know how to respond. So what do we do? And don't hesitate to make an appointment with one of our social workers to help you with this. because Everybody's situation is, is different. We always say that, you know, everybody with dementia has their own individual journey. When you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person with dementia. So you may need to do some individualized planning. And please don't hesitate to call and ask for an appointment. So when people go missing from their residences, where they live, it's hard. The first thing says remain calm. Nobody's calm. If you think somebody's missing, I know. We all go into a tizzy, high panic. Um, I had that the other day. I, I showed up and um, my relative was not there. And I tell you, my heartbeat went whoop, through the ceiling. So... What we need to do is seriously take the few seconds to calm down that it takes to take a deep breath. You wanna seriously breathe in and whoosh it out. You cannot think well if you don't have good oxygen to your brain and you are gonna to need to think well in the next few minutes. So keep yourself calm with some deep breathing. That's where you start. You want to call 911 immediately. There is a myth out there that you wait because they're an adult. No, 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 no. I know that came from, let's say, American TV, but you do not wait. If somebody with dementia is missing, you call 911. You want to have that emergency kit or that identification kit ready so it's ready to go if there's an emergency. And you want to think about What's the most reasonable plan? So my initial plan was to look very carefully through the whole house. And that um, involves opening doors where you don't think they would be anyway. Check in walk-in closets, even though the door's shut and the light's off. Check in walk-in closets. Check in the back corner of the basement. Check in the furnace room. Go through the whole house and look in the whole house. Then maybe you want to mobilize some support. You might want to call um, a neighbor, a friend, a relative. I, I can't find so-and-so. 
do you, do you know if something came up and somebody took them out and they didn't leave a note? Do you know where they might be? No, come and help me. You always want to make sure that somebody's at the house in case the person comes back. If you decide to go searching for them and you go out and they come back, you don't know and you're still out there searching or they come back and they still don't see anybody and out they go. So again, so you always want to make sure that there's somebody at home in case the person returns. Often neighbors can be very helpful. And we suggest that you actually, if you are concerned and uh, you have the possibility of doing this, that you alert your neighbors ahead of time that, you know, sometimes so-and-so likes to go out, out for a walk. Um, if you see them heading out without me, give me a call or note the direction they headed in. Your neighbors can, can be good eyes and support you in that. Um, and you, you want to call the police. The police will ask a number of questions. They're, they're going to want that little ID form that, that you filled out. They may want to know if they still have access to a car. Just because they've lost their license doesn't mean they won't get in the car and drive the car. Um, so be alert, check the garage, see if the car is gone, see if the keys are gone. Know if they still have a valid credit card in their wallet. I remember an incident and um, it was the gals from the Niagara Alzheimer's Society that, that told me this story. And there was a gentleman who um, really, really wanted to go visit his brother in the States. And although he didn't have a car anymore, he still had his wallet and he had credit cards in his wallet. And this, uh, you know, is about 15 years ago. So nothing was automated. You still had uh, human beings behind the wicket. And he went to his local bus uh, station and he, um, they helped him organize a ticket and got him on a bus and sent him down to Buffalo, right across the border. And it was in Buffalo that people realized that there's a problem. This gentleman definitely has a problem. And uh, they, they called up because it's so close, they, they called up the Alzheimer's Society of Niagara. They were able to actually safely return him to Canada. He was off to see his brother, who unfortunately had passed away approximately 15 years before. So if people still have access to money or a credit card, they can often access transportation. One of the things you wanna do is you wanna make that quick search inside the house, including the garage, see if keys, cars, credit cards are missing. Look around outside the house a bit, but not, not too much, not for too long. And uh, if, you're in a, if you're in a rural area, you don't wanna go too far afield. You wanna leave a scent um, in case they decide that uh, the, the search you know, would be enhanced by maybe using a tracking dog or something like that. You don't wanna tromp over all, all the scents that are available. Um, don't, don't head into the fields and the forests. If you're in a rural setting, you know, check your house and yard, but don't go into the fields and forests. One of the things that um, you might want to think about when somebody's going missing is what were they wearing? Well, your mind will probably go blank. The minute the police officer says to you, well, what did they have on? <laughs> it's hard to remember, especially day to day, very similar outfits. One of the things that um, was suggested to us that the, the lady whose mother went missing and went to sick kids in Toronto, what she did every day after that is she had a smartphone, a, a cell phone. And every day she just quietly took a picture of her mom that morning on her phone so that she always had an up-to-date photo and knew exactly what she was wearing. So that's something to think about. If missing incidents are an issue in your life, I would encourage you to think about taking a picture on your smartphone every day so you always have the updated. Reuniting after a missing incident. Um, we, we don't want people to panic, although we've been feeling panicked. So we need to prepare ourselves. We need to be prepared for what they might need as well as psychologically for getting back together. If they left, in the middle of the afternoon and now it's early evening and they've been found, maybe it's much cooler. Maybe you need to bring a jacket for them. 
Maybe they've been missing for a few hours, <clears throat> excuse me, and they need their meds and you should have your meds with you to give them right away. Or maybe a snack if they're diabetic, maybe you wanna make sure you get some food, excuse me. When you do get back together, providing reassurance is hugely important. I'm afraid this is not a time for lectures. You might feel like it and you might in your relief feel like saying, never do that again, never do that again. But what that will do, unfortunately, is only leave the emotion of the upset with the person and not the idea or the details of what you said to them. So we wanna provide them with reassurance. It's okay, come on home, got a safe place for you, got a warm bed for you, it's all good. You have to keep your perspective. Please don't blame, it, it is not the person's fault. It's not your fault. Sometimes there's just a perfect storm of incidents like that lady who never had had an incident in the past when she went to do laundry and her husband disappeared. Was it her fault for doing laundry? No. Was it his fault for forgetting? No, it was nobody's fault. And sometimes we need to remember that. We just need to say, what can we do to keep people as safe as possible? And it's hugely important to ask for help. You can ask for help from the Alzheimer's Society, from the police force, from neighbors, you can get information. Don't try to go it alone. Nobody can be vigilant 24 seven without a break. So I wanna talk a little bit about resources. When it comes to prevention, here are some ideas for you. For sure, fill out the identification kit found on the Finding Your Way website. And I would recommend that you fill out more than one. If you still have a car in your family, keep one in the glove compartment of the car because you never know when a missing incident is gonna happen. And if you've gone somewhere and it looks less familiar to somebody you, and you've got filled out the kit, but you've left it on the fridge at home, and here you are in a different city or a different place, it's not gonna do you much good. So keep one in your glove compartment and keep one somewhere at home that you can easily access it. Encourage, if it's possible for you, to sign up to Medic Alert. We're gonna talk you through how to do that. Um, carrying identification, that's really important. Um, stick a, a an ID card or a business card, if they don't carry their wallet anymore, if they carry their wallet all the time because that's what they always did, that's pretty good. But if they don't do that anymore, you might wanna put one in every sweater pocket, every jacket pocket, every coat pocket, um, you, or every purse they own, whatever. You wanna, you wanna spread those IDs around so they, they always have ID with them. You can consider a locating device, and we're gonna look at that in some detail. I've mentioned involving neighbors, friends, and families. Having a buddy system, maybe there's somebody they could walk with. When people say, what can I do? Hey, you, you walk with him on Tuesday mornings and you walk with him on Thursdays and divvy it up and have a buddy that they can go with. Uh, and if, if that won't, won't work for you, at least create check-in systems and routines that they always go at the same time, that they always walk the same route, that um, if they are savvy with a cell phone, you know, and they're going to go to Tim's to meet their friends for coffee, they call you when they get to Tim's, you know, they got there, or you set it up with the buddies. As soon as, you know, so-and-so gets there, give me a ring. Um, so you can have check-in systems as well. If people um, don't have a driver's license anymore, but want to have ID, you can get an Ontario photo ID card. And I'll talk about that. In, in a minute in some detail. So I just wanna reiterate the information in the identification kit, because I'm pretty sure some of you at the end of the call will go online or will call us, you'll get an ID kit, you'll fill it out and you'll put it somewhere safe. I wanna talk about updating it every once in a while. If your circumstances change, if things change, please have it updated. So this is the kind of information that they're asking for. Physical description, identifying features, recent photo, medical info, potential places to look, car and license plate info, emergency contact. What if now they use a cane and they didn't use a cane before? Or what if now they use a walker and they didn't use a walker before? You wanna keep it updated. And if you can fill it in and have it ready to go, 
Um, and we have suggested other places. I certainly say keep it in the car as well as at home. You might want to have a copy if they uh, start, attend a day program, make sure that the day program or people they visit regularly. If, if you have maybe uh, somebody who has dementia and they visit, they have kids and they visit all three kids on a regular basis, you might want one at each of the kids' houses. Just something to think about. So let's talk about Medic Alert. It's a nationwide program designed to help identify the person who's lost and assist in safe return. So members get an engraved ID bracelet and the response is immediate and it works well throughout Canada and the US. Uh, there is a cost associated to it, but I'm, I'm gonna go through that with you in a minute. We'll move on in life. This photo ID that I was talking about, if somebody loses their driver's license, you can go to Service Ontario. Um, you need some original identity documents to prove your legal name, your date of birth, your signature. Um, and you can uh, apply for one of these wallet sized cards. So it's government issued ID. It's valid if you're over 16, you live in Ontario and you don't have a driver's license. There is a cost, but um, you know, sometimes for some people, it, it gives them a great sense of security to have this in their wallet. And so I invite you, if you are interested, to, to look into that a little bit. If you still have a driver's license, you don't, that's legal, you don't want to have one of these. Usually you would use a driver's license. This would be ID to replace your driver's license if you're losing your driver's license. So a few more helpful uh, ideas and resources. Uh, as I mentioned before, one thing alone probably won't work. You want a combination of ideas. So this slide might look a little busy, but you do have it in writing. And we've got lots of ideas for you. Medic Alert Safely Home, Project Lifesaver, Lifeline, Door Alarms, Motion Detectors, GPS, Bluetooth, mats, posters, banners. This is just a list of everything I've talked about here in one easy list. The other thing you might wanna think about is if you're not um, connected to somebody on our social work team and you wanna talk about these things or you wanna talk about anything else that has to do with dementia, we are the go-to place. Any kind of dementia, we have supportive counseling. So if you have questions or concerns, or you need some support and some help, please don't hesitate to phone. Phone the office and, and get yourself an appointment. You know we have education sessions, you're sitting in one of them now. Uh, we have a great variety of social and recreational programs. In fact, we can offer them five days a week now, five mornings and five afternoons. So we have a lot going on. If you wanna keep somebody busy and engaged and less likely to walk out the door because they're bored, I would encourage you to check out some of our social and recreational programs. Um, you've learned a bit about finding your way. I won't talk to that right now. For any of you who aren't involved in the Minds in Motion program, it's a fabulous program. It's designed for a person living with dementia and their care partner to come together. We do it obviously over Zoom right now during COVID and it involves an exercise portion and we know that getting regular exercise is huge for helping de-stress people. Um, and uh, that, that's a big piece of keeping people happy where they're at. And then after the exercise portion, there's a social recreational portion and, and it involves some cognitive stimulation and some connecting with other people. So very, very good for everybody involved. We also have um, a, a number of support groups. So if you are interested in any of our support groups, please call the office. That's all it takes is a phone call and they can hook you up with the right group for you and your circumstances. Another thing that uh, we can offer you is some enhanced education. These enhanced care programs go beyond a lecture. They give you an opportunity to interact with other caregivers, 
and to really look at your own personal issues and problems, what you're struggling with, what behaviors are challenging to you or what communication issues are a challenge for you and to brainstorm and practice them in a, in a safe setting with a facilitator. Um, they are offered in conjunction with Mount Sinai. And what I'm going to do when you get your evaluation today is I'm going to include a handout with all the details about each course, what it involves, how long it runs, uh, the, the information you need to see if it would be a good fit for you. The other thing that we have is um, a digital literacy club for care partners. And I bring this up because if you're thinking, oh, well, okay, I, I, I got the Finding Your Way website, but I'm nervous about being online, or I'm not comfortable with, with Zoom, and I, I want more information, or, hey, that Finding Your Way website, I notice it's got some, some mini modules. It's got four 15-minute interactive education modules. I want to take them, but I, I don't feel comfortable. Pete, who's on many of our calls, who you might know, is running a digital literacy club and it starts in March and I cannot recommend Pete highly enough. He knows his stuff. He is so patient with me when it comes to technology uh, and he would extend that courtesy to anybody, obviously. And uh, Pete will help you learn what you need so that you will not be nearly as uh, restricted by COVID. You will be freer to get online, to connect with family and friends. He can help you whether you're on a phone or an iPad or a computer. And I'm going to give um, a brochure on that as well with the evaluation. I would encourage you, if you have any hesitancy or if you just want to brush up your skills or ask some tech questions, join the Literacy Club and uh, Pete can tell you all about it. Of course, we always put a slide in to let you know that we need to raise funds. Uh, we need to raise 60% of our budget every year so that we can say to you, our services are no charge. You need a service from us, call us. That's all it takes. So if you're ever thinking about making a donation, we would appreciate it very much. Um, but we are happy to, we are here to help and we are happy to provide you service. And uh, all you have to do is phone us. And this is how you get connected. Here's our contact information. The phone number's there. The website is there. Again, these links are live. And you will notice that um, we have some icons. If you're a Facebook person, we have a Facebook page. We have Twitter. And this is the new icon for YouTube. And so uh, we are taping the talk today so that we can put it up on YouTube later. Um, don't tell your friends and family to see you because you're a star because you will not be on this at all. It will just be the slides, but you can get the basic information and share it with them. And if you were to go onto our website and go right to the bottom and click on this icon, the YouTube icon, it would take you to a page that has um, a wide variety of videos social and recreational videos, uh, exercise videos, uh, education videos, tons of videos that we have made specifically for people living with dementia or that we have found to share specifically with people living with dementia. Now in a minute, we're gonna unmute and do the questions, but what I want to do is I wanna share something else with you first, and I am gonna try to get that website up, but first, the other thing that I'm going to share right now is about locating devices. This gives you some great detail on what's the difference between GPS and um, radio frequency. GPS works off the satellite, so it has advantages and disadvantages just as radio frequency does. It looks at ethical issues. It really gives you um, questions. What it does is it helps you decide by asking you some different questions what the best device might be for you. And so I would encourage you to take a look at that. It won't give you a brand name. It won't give you a particular answer, but it will help guide you to what's right for your situation. So we've included that on the handout. The other thing is that that we have for you is share screen. Okay, 
This is something that was on the Finding Your Way website. There's two parts to it. And it's strategies, a whole bunch of strategies. And what it does is it looks at people in different risk categories. And I share this with you today because many people got back to me and said, I'm really worried about it, or I'm not worried about it or uh, at all, or should I be even worried about it? So it looks at low risk, medium risk, and high risk and unplanned absences. And it will help you maybe give you a sense of where your person might be and then some ideas and suggestions for you. So that's a two page handout that you've got. And we're just going to. Now, can you see a chart with four? Okay, this is a two page chart and I wanna spend a little bit of time on this with you because this is the best summary tool you're gonna find for the current available supports within our communities. And I'm not talking about things you buy yourself. This is uh, finding your way website. This page talks about finding your way, medic alert, project lifesaver, and the vulnerable persons registry. For each one of these four systems that are designed to help keep somebody safe, what we've done is we've given you a summary so you can compare and contrast. You can look right across and see what's finding your way about. What do you need to know about medical alert? What's the vulnerable persons registry? That will give you a clear image of, of what it is all about. Then what are the highlights of the program? So we've, we've given you base information, then we've pulled out the highlights for each program. And under that, is there a fee? because that could make a difference to you. Finding your way, obviously no charge for information. Uh, there is a fee for Medical Alert Safely Home, but it is a registered charity. If you are in a position that you need a Medical Alert and you cannot afford the $60 a year, then please be in touch with them and explain your circumstances. Uh, Project Lifesaver, there is quite a large fee for that. But again, if it was necessary, if you needed Project Lifesaver. And this is designed for somebody who is unfortunately um, leaving on a very regular basis. Um, the uh, Rockwood uh, Kinsman's Club uh, set, stepped up or the, and they said, if anybody needs it, we will cover the cost of it. So again, um, if it is something that you need, you would access that in Guelph and Wellington through the police services, through victim services at the, at the police. It's not something designed for everybody. There's a niche market for these, but they work really well for people who are repeatedly leaving. And then the vulnerable persons registry has no charge. If you look on the second half of the page, it gives you the information on what you would do to register, how you would get a hold of these people. If there is any eligibility criteria, that's listed there, and then where to get more information, phone numbers, emails. So that is a really handy tool, and we've got that for you as well. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to try, we, we're almost at 11, but I'm going to try to get the website up for you. I've thought of a new way, and so screen share. let's see if this will work. Can you see that now? You know what? Old fashioned is better. Unplug the monitor. It works like a charm. So this is exactly what the website looks like. My favorite thing is I can make the text large enough for me to read. Um, don't forget if you blow the text up um, and, and something looks like it's, you blew it up too much and it looks like it fell off the page, you can take it down a bit too. But you can make the text. You can do any language that you like. So uh, it defaults to English, but do any language that you like. There's a section for first responders. You just ignore that. That's for the police. But living safely with dementia, how to build safe communities, online learning, locating technology, and then the resources. And I'm going to just take you through this very briefly. So there is a great resource guide, the safety booklet. We've been promoting it for a long time now. You can um, just bring it up. 
This is how to live safely in the community. And here it looks at safety plans, home safety, sleeping habits, staying social, staying active, driving, travel, meds, nutrition, living alone, assessing the environment. If for some reason you cannot access this, please just call the office and we will send you a hard copy. One of the things that you might want to think about is just um, scrolling down family and care partner information, how you can reduce the risk. Um, when you go to the section on online learning, there are four modules. You can take little extra um, courses, so to speak. They're short, they're free. They're about 15 minutes each. Um, I wanna take you to the resources though. Here we are, resources. So, um, there's videos. One of the things that's nice is um, many people have shared their stories. So you can actually um, read about people's real realities and what happened. Um, this is the little booklet, the practical guide, uh, how the community, if you want to get your friends and neighbors involved, you can look at how the community can help. How to Live Safely with Dementia, there's the resource guide. Again, if you support somebody with dementia, here are some ideas. If you are a person living with, idea, uh, living with dementia, there's some ideas for you here in this section. But here's the, the large size identification kit, incident response checklist. In other words, what do you do when somebody goes missing? Then over here, the post incident, what do you do when you get back together? All of that is under resources. So that's what the website looks like. Don't think that you finish the page just because you get to, you know, the, the picture. Just keep scrolling, scroll all the way down. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to invite you to unmute yourselves. Janine, did anything?